The date is May 21st, 2019. The time is 2.24 p.m. Present in the Internal Affairs Division Office are Terrence Markadal, his representative Zeb Davis, Sergeant Ryan Bullard, and myself, Detective Joe Brown. The purpose of this meeting is to conduct an interview of Terrence Markadal, who is an employee with the Sacramento Police Department in the capacity of police officer. This is an administrative investigation on the charges of excessive force, firearm discharge, neglect of duty, and improper tactics involving Officer Jared Robinette and Officer Terrence Mercadal. This is an administrative investigation only on these charges. Do you understand that? Yes. However, since the allegations indicated that a crime may have been committed, I'm advising you that, one, you have the right to remain silent. Two, anything you say may be used against you in court. Three, you have the right to the presence of an attorney before and during any questioning. Four, if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you free of charge before any questioning if you want. Do you understand each of these rights that I've explained to you? Yes. Having these rights in mind, do you wish to talk to us now? No. Okay. Although you have the right to remain silent and not to incriminate yourself, your silence can be deemed insubordination and result in administrative discipline. Do you understand that based upon the authority vested in me by the Chief of Police, I am ordering you to answer all of our questions? Yes. Any statement made under compulsion of a threat of discipline cannot be used against you in a later criminal proceeding. However, if you do not answer our questions truthfully and fully, a charge of insubordination may be imposed which could result in discipline up to and including termination. Do you understand this is an administrative investigation? Yes. Do you understand the allegations? Yes. Do you understand that I'm ordering you to answer our questions and that if you do not answer them truthfully and fully, it could result in disciplinary action up to and including termination? Yes. For the record, please state and spell your name. Terrence Mercadel, first name T-E-R-R-E-N-C-E, -E -E, last M-E-R-C-A-D-A-L. Did you graduate from the Sacramento Police Academy? Yes. When did you graduate? Uh, 2016, June 2016. Do you have any prior law enforcement experience? Yes, I do. And where was that at? At Olive Branch Police Department. And uh, Olive Branch Police Department, where is that? That is in uh, the city of Olive Branch in the state of Mississippi. And what years or what time frame were you working there with Olive Branch Police? Between 2010 and 2014. Okay. And that was as a sworn police officer? Correct, yes. Did you have any kind of specialized training or assignment at this prior agency? Uh, yes. And what was that? Uh, SWAT team, special weapons, and tactics. Okay. What is your current assignment and shift? Uh, current assignment is uh, investigative role with the Sexual Assault and Child Abuse Unit. How long have you been in that uh, current assignment? Approximately six months. What was your assignment and shift in March of 2018? Uh, I was a patrolman on the swing shift uh, junior team. Okay. And what area was that? That was in uh, Sector 5. What part of Sacramento would that be? Uh, that would be in the South Sac Meadow View neighborhood. Okay. Have you had any kind of specialized training or assignment with the Sacramento Police Department? Yes. Such as? Uh, I have uh, had specialized training, which includes... Um, It would include uh, firearms training. Uh, it would include uh, tactical medicine uh, training as well. Uh, there was uh, additional training with regards to uh, handling mentally ill individuals. Yes. Prior to this interview, I provided you and your representative with the following items from SPD case 18-82449. The CAD call printout, your body worn camera footage, a 19. I'll fix this with me. I'll take a break here. I'll fix some. Um, 
once we take a break here, I'll get you an extra little video clip. There's a 19 second video clip from Sergeant Morris's body worn camera video, and I'll have that for you after the break. Um, a video recording of your interview with homicide detectives on March 19th, 2018. Your statement to SPD homicide detective Cruz on March 19th, 2018. An SSD air unit star video. Your round count form. An audio recording of radio traffic. A transcription of that radio traffic. An aerial photo of 29th Street. A Google Maps overhead photo of the area of 29th Street shown to you during your homicide interview on March 19, 2018. A copy of your post training record. A 2018 SPD CPT first aid CPR update course outline. A three page law enforcement tactical lifesaver course outline. A 90 page tactical lifesaver course student guide booklet. A four page crisis intervention behavioral health training course outline an eight-page crisis intervention training expanded course outline, a copy of your range training qualification record, General Order 580.02 Revision Date 5-16-2017, General Order 580.03 Revision Date 1-19-2018, General Order 580.12 Revision Date 10-9-2012, General Order 522.01 Revision Date 3-16-2018, General Order 522.02, Revision Date 516-2017, and General Order 525.07, Revision Date 426-2017, and a copy of the Blue Sheet complaint form relating to this investigation. Have you had a chance to review these? Yes. For the record, these general orders were the current policies in place on March 18, 2018. We are here to conduct an administrative interview with you regarding SPD case 18-82449, an officer-involved shooting which you were involved in on March 18th, 2018. Before we begin our interview, it's been almost a year and two months since the incident occurred, and there has been an unprecedented amount of video, audio reports, press releases, media coverage, and several investigations that have been made public regarding this incident. With that in mind, is there anything else that is not contained in Sacramento Police Report 18-82449, your transcribed statement, your videotaped interview that you have identified that needs to be added, clarified, or elaborated on? No. Okay. Have you received training in emergency first aid and CPR? Yes. And specifically referring to your post record here. Specifically, what training as far as uh, first aid and CPR? Uh, specifically, a first aid and CPR uh, update training course, which uh, was attended during, I believe, continued professional training. And do you recall the date on that? February 12th, 2018. Okay. Did you also take a class, an eight-hour course, called a Tactical Lifesaver course? Yes. And when was the date on that? March 28th, 2017. Can you describe the Tactical Lifesaver course as to the materials it covers, practicals you participate in, or lesson plans? Yes, the course covers uh, information pertaining to uh, administering first aid in emergency uh, situations. Uh, some referred to um, include active shooter investigations, downed officer, um, hostage situations, downed uh, subjects, and administering uh, first aid in a safe manner and how to uh, perform those specific medical procedures. Have you attended crisis intervention training or CIT? Yes. And when was that? Uh, Looks the two dates. Um, there is a crisis intervention training March tenth, twenty seventeen. <clears throat> you have any other dates on there? Uh, yes, and then uh, May eighth, twenty seventeen. Do you also <clears throat> have one in there September twenty eighth, two thousand seventeen? Yes. Can you describe what CIT is and what is taught in that course? It's a crisis intervention training and it deals specifically with handling the mentally ill, 
um, goes over specific information on uh, how to observe and how to uh, conduct the escalation of uh, a person who is experiencing a mental health crisis. Have you attended department training that talks about cover and concealment? Not referring to anything specifically in there, but, but yes. based on your training experience? Yes. And can you explain what that is uh, regarding cover and concealment? Yes. Uh, based on my training experience, cover typically is uh, a fortified or some type of uh, position that provides you a level of protection from a deadly threat or a threat of harm or concealment uh, just hides you and it keeps you uh, hidden from a perceived threat or an imminent threat. Okay. As a police officer, especially working patrol, how often <clears throat> would you utilize cover and concealment? Constantly. Did you ever take any kind of uh, departmental training or course about containment or perimeters? Yes. And can you explain what that is? Uh, containment and perimeter courses are typically uh, taught uh, with regards to um, the proper protocol in establishing a perimeter if, uh, let's say, a one, a foot, foot pursuit ensues, or if a uh, dangerous or wanted subject is kind of uh, loose in a particular area and how to utilize resources to um, uh, contain the individual. Have you been trained the concepts of contact arrest teams? Yes. And can you explain what that is? Uh, contact and arrest teams, basically, uh, in reference to a contact team, a contact team is uh, the team that is best prepared to deal with uh, whatever um, threat is uh, immediately apparent or exist in a particular situation. This consists typically of multiple officers. Uh, it can be as a minimum of two officers if needed uh, and they are prepared with a variety of uh, different force options in order to uh, deal with that threat. A rescue team is basically the team that is established to go and deal with the downed person, whether that be a downed officer or citizen. Have you been trained the concepts of cover officers? Yes. Can you explain what that is? A uh, cover officer is essentially uh, an individual who provides protection for the contact officers. Basically, they're, uh, they're, they're watching their back. They're watching for threats. Are the use of contact teams and cover officers a common practice in police work? Yes. And is that for officer safety reasons? Yes. Have you received training relating to tactics and strategies for armed subjects? Yes. And have you utilized those tactics and strategies throughout your career? Yes. Is distance a key factor to officer safety? Yes. And can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, when feasible, distance is uh, used to allow reaction time for the officer to perceive the threat that's uh, being uh, placed in front of him or her. Have you been involved in any officer-involved shootings other than this case? No. Would you agree that all Sacramento police officers have been trained and have some of the experience in the areas that we've talked about here? Yes. In referring to your range qualification record, uh, could you please state the last your last qualification date prior to March 18th of 2018? Yes, uh, that date is December 5th, 2017. It appears it's at uh, 5 p.m. Okay. And this range quali qualification would have been with your department issued handgun, which you were equipped with on March 18, 2018? Yes. Okay. Referring to your statement that you gave to homicide investigators on March 19th, 2018, do you remember what videos you were allowed to watch prior to the interview with homicide detectives? Yes. Uh, my body worn camera footage uh, is what I was allowed to watch. I believe uh, that was all I was allowed to watch was my body worn camera footage. Okay. What type of equipment did you carry with you on the date of the shooting? 
Uh, I was in my standard uh, police uniform, uh, which included my body-worn camera, which was affixed to about the middle of my chest. Uh, my bullet bulletproof vest, uh, my body armor, my duty belt was on. Give me a moment to recall the placement of everything on my duty belt, but. Uh, with, um, within my duty belt, I had handcuff case in the front, uh, my firearm in its holster with a tactical light, a set of keys used for um, various reasons, uh, flashlight, a department issued flashlight, uh, a tourniquet, spare magazines. Uh, my department issued uh, taser and uh, my radio. To your knowledge, was all of your equipment, including your body worn camera, functioning properly at the beginning of your shift on March 18, 2018? Yes. Were you on duty March 18, 2018 at 9 17 p.m.? Yes. Was your identifier 1 Charles 5 7? Yes. And you were a mid-watch patrol unit at this time, is that correct? Correct. And what were your hours typically for that shift? Uh, it is from 2.30 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. Okay. On March 18, 2018, 21, 17 hours, did you respond to a call for service in the area of 29th Street regarding a car clout or car burglary in progress? Yes. <clears throat> Would that type of call for service typically require a one or two officer response? Uh, it would require a two officer response. And what would the reason for that be? For the reasons of officer safety, um, any crime in progress uh, has the potential to be inherently dangerous, so it is uh, a minimum of two officers required. Can you summarize the information about the call you knew at the time when you were responding? Yes. Um, in summary, uh, there was a complainant who had observed a male subject who had broken, uh, was in the process of either breaking into vehicles or vandalizing vehicles. Uh, this complainant contacted the individual and the individual ran away and was hiding within a backyard, uh, which I believe was the listed address on the call, 29th Street. Were you driving a fully marked SPD <coughs> patrol vehicle and in full SPD uniform? Yes. Did another SPD patrol officer respond to this call as well with you? Yes. And who was that? That was uh, Officer Jared Robinette. And what was Officer Robinette's identifier? One Charles 5-4. How long had you and Officer Robinette, leading up to this call, uh, worked together? Um, approximately three months. And was he on the same patrol team as you at that time? Yes. During your response to this call, did you and Officer Ro uh, Robinette formulate any kind of plan as to how this call would be handled? No. Do you recall a description of the suspect given by the caller? Uh, yes, give me a moment to refer to my notes. Please. The uh, basic description was uh, a male subject, unknown race, uh, between I believe five ten six foot, uh, wearing dark a dark hooded sweatshirt and dark pants. It was a very vague description. An SSD air unit star responded to this call as well, correct? Yes. To your knowledge, was star on scene for this call prior to your arrival? Yes. Do you recall any information that Star had broadcasted regarding this call prior to your arrival? Yes. Uh, prior to our arrival, Star was checking the area um, for potential heat signatures, and heat signatures means people and uh, individuals that are out and about, and uh, he had indicated that he had not seen anything. 
The CAD call indicates that at 2131 hours you arrived on scene for this call. Is that correct? No, give me a moment to refer to my notes. Yes. Do you recall who the primary officer on the call was? Uh, it appears the initial primary officers on the call were uh, it was two Charles five, four five, which was from the uh, neighboring district, and I believe Officer uh, Robinette and I chose to be the primary officers on the call to make sure they didn't have to come into that area to handle the call. It was our responsibility. Was there a primary officer though designated between you and Officer Robinette when you responded to this call that you can recall? Not that I can recall. When you arrived on scene, did you contact the caller complainant? Uh, Officer Robinette initially contacted him and began uh, obtaining information. Okay. I'm going to refu or review your body worn camera footage from this call with you here. <clears throat> Time or date time stamp here reads 2018-03-19, then T is in Tom, 04 colon 18 colon 57 Z zebra for Zulu time. At 041906, you appear to walk up to Officer Robinette, who is contacting the caller here. Is that correct? Yes. And to clarify here, um, 0419 hours Zulu time would translate to 2119 hours specific standard time. Um, so to clarify with you, as the CAD call indicates that your on scene time is 2131 hours. Would your actual physical on scene time be approximately 21, 19 hours? Yes. Based on your training experience, can you explain why that time discrepancy with the CAD call uh, time might be? Uh, at times, there might be uh, delays in when the dispatcher updates the uh, on scene location time compared to body more camera actual, actual time. And we'll note for the record, your body-worn camera footage here has video but no audio for the first 30 seconds, correct? Correct. Okay, and is that standard as to how Axon brand SPD-issued body-worn cameras function with no audio for the first 30 seconds? Yes, it is. So 041914, is this Officer Robinette? Yes. Okay. And what is it that it appeared that Ro Officer Robinette was doing at that time? Uh, at that time, we were, uh, what Officer Robinette was doing was looking in the direction to which the complainant was saying he last saw the person responsible for breaking into car windows. What, and Officer Robinette, was he initially speaking to this complainant? Yes. From what you'd seen? And did you speak with uh, Mr. at all at this point? I just overheard the conversation, so I was not speaking to him directly. Okay. Do you recall anything that Mr. said to Officer Robinette? Uh, I recall him uh, pointing to the house in which he uh, saw the subject run and saying that he believed he was still over there. You recall if uh, verbalized any kind of suspect descriptions at all to Officer Robinette or anything like that? Uh, it was uh, a repeat of the description on the call. And at this time, did you observe the vehicles that Mr. claimed were broken into? Yes, some of them that were on the street. Okay. Do you have your statement? So in referring to page 11 of your statement to homicide detectives, you said... I did recall seeing two vehicle windows smashed out and glass on the ground. 
I believe the driver's side windows of both vehicles had their windows smashed and broken out and I could see the glass reflecting off the light in the street. Is that correct? Just a moment to... Uh, I'll try and let you in the... We'll try and let you place, catch yeah. up here. Mm -hmm. No problem. Again, it started with, I did, this is page 11, I did recall seeing two vehicle windows smashed out and glass on the ground. Yes. Yes, I do see that. Yes. Okay. That Does that sound that. accurate? Okay. That is accurate. Okay. Based on the information you had at this point, can you describe what crime, if any, you were investigating at this point, given the information that you had? Uh, given the information I had, uh, we were investigating a... Uh, multiple vehicle burglaries that have occurred. Okay. And given the information you had and the recent time element in this incident occurring, did you have concerns or reason to believe that the suspect was possibly still in the immediate area? Yes. And as you described, you were investigating a possible auto burglary at this point. Is auto burglary as defined under 459 of the California Penal Code a crime in the state of California? Yes. And this can be a misdemeanor or a felony, depending on the circumstances, is that correct? Yes. Did Mr. direct you and Officer Rabinette towards a location where he last saw the suspect flee? Yes, he did. Do you recall the address of that? Twenty ninth Street. Yes. Okay. I provided you with General Order 522.01, Handling Mentally Ill Persons, Revision Date 316-2018. Would you mind read, reading aloud the highlighted portions of that? <clears throat> yes, beginning with policy. Uh, it shall be the policy of the Sacramento Police Department that officers handling mentally ill persons proceed in a manner consistent with the safety and well-being of all persons involved. Officers are increasingly required to respond to and intervene on behalf of persons who are in mental health crisis. While officers are not expected to make mental health diagnosis, they are expected to recognize signs and symptoms that may suggest a mental illness, as well as behaviors that are indicative of mental health crisis. The goal is to use de-escalation techniques to max maximize the likelihood of a safe outcome for officers and individuals and the community. Uh, moving down to uh, section C, one, use of force or physical restraints. Officers shall utilize only that amount of force necessary to secure the custody of the mentally ill person pursuant to 5150 W9 of the Welf which is uh, Welfare and Institutions Code. Officers shall handcuff all, handcuff all mentally ill persons taken into custody unless the age or physical condition of the person is such that the personal safety of the person and officer will clearly not be jeopardized. Did you have any information on this call or reason to believe up to this point that the outstanding suspect had a mental illness or was dealing with a mental crisis of any kind? No, we had no information. Based on your training and experience, have individuals committed auto burglaries or other forms of burglary who, to the best of your knowledge, are not mentally ill or going through a mental health crisis? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Is it common practice for Sacramento police officers to arrest and book individuals who have committed a public offense, even if they have a mental illness or are dealing with a mental crisis? Yes. Were you equipped with a less lethal shotgun in your patrol vehicle on March 18, 2018? Yes. You had been issued one at that time? Yes. Okay. Based on the information on the call that you had regarding an auto burglary, would it have been routine to deploy and arm yourself with a less lethal weapon system such as the beanbag shotgun, CED taser, pepperball gun, while investigating that call at that point? Uh, no, it, it would not have been reasonable um, as it actually pertains to uh, General Order 580.12 for less lethal weapon systems. Um, you, you shall not deploy a less lethal weapon system unless you know that you are going to encounter um, a specific situation that might uh, need it. 
Do you recall if Officer Rob Nett advised STAR, SSD's helicopter unit, of the information he had provided as to where the suspect was last seen in a possible direction of travel? Uh, yes. And then you and Officer Rob Nett went to this location that Mr. directed you to, correct? Correct. I want to refer to a map here that homicide investigators provided for you during your interview here. Um, and then referring to page 8 of your statement. Do you have the highlighted version there? Yes. Okay. I'll make it easier. Okay. Um, do you find page 8 there of your statement? Yes, sir. Okay, so referring to this map that was shown to you, and on page 8 of your statement, a homicide investigator was taken on March 19, 2018. You pointed at this Google map image where it was indicated in your statement that this was 29th Street that directed you to, um, correct? Correct. Now, to clarify here, the, the call for service on this had indicated it was 29th Street, where Mr. was calling about. So that would be approximately one house north of what you were indicating on this map. Yes. So as to clarify, uh, would be approximately two houses north of 29th Street, um, where the shooting occurred. This would be three houses north of 29th Street. Yes. Are you are you sure as far as it being 29th Street to where Mr directed you to? Uh, yes, uh, because I remember referring back to my voluntary statement, uh, I remember specifically seeing the shed that was in the corner of the yard. Okay, I'm going to refer to your body cam footage here real quick. <clears throat> I'm going to speed up here to Are you able to see the address numbers on that? I am now. Property. So we're stopped at 40420 mm -hmm. 20. Can you tell what address numbers that appears to be? Okay. Is, so to clarify, is this the address that you were referring to in your homicide statement that when they showed you the map yes. at the time? Okay. So as opposed to it would be in fact. Yes. Okay. That was mistaken. Uh, once you and Officer Robinette went to this address, what did you do? Uh, we contacted the homeowner and uh, asked her permission to, we advised her of the situation, and then we asked for uh, permission to check her backyard. And did you and Officer Robinette check the backyard? Yes. Okay. After checking that uh, backyard with Officer Robinette, did you find the subject in question? No, we did not. Okay. I'll fast forward again here. So 04 24 you and Officer Robinette, um, after finishing your backyard search of this location at 29th Street, you both returned back towards 29th Street, is that correct? Yes. Zero four twenty five forty. You and Officer Robinette appear to begin running southbound on southbound direction on 29th Street. Is that correct? Yes. Can you explain why at that time? Uh, yes, we had begun receiving information from the Sheriff's Department helicopter um, that he had spotted a subject two houses to the south, um, jumping over fences and heading south. And are you hearing these updates from STAR over your portable radio? 
Yes, I uh, that evening I was uh, equipped with a earpiece, and the earpiece basically goes directly from my paddle mic into my ear, and uh, that's used to um, help make sure that I get the information directly into my ear, and also provides a, a tactical advantage, so my radio is not loud enough for everyone to hear. So that was going to be my follow-up question. So there doesn't appear to be any kind of audible radio traffic on your body-worn camera footage here, and that is due to the earpiece that you had on your time or on at that time that would have all that audio in your ear instead. Yes, all that information is coming in constantly uh, into my ear. On page nine of your statement, you indicated that Star advised that the same subject appeared to break out a window and that you believe the information was that the subject was breaking out a car window at that point. Is that correct? Yes. And then going to page 17 of your statement. I'll wait for you to catch yeah. up there. Let me know when you're there. Okay. I'm there. To your recollection at that time, when asked if you had heard updated information about the suspect breaking a window to a residence, you believed Star advised that it was a car window as opposed to a residence, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. On page 16 of your statement, you indicated that Star put out an update that the suspect was attempting to break into a vehicle and that there was something in his hands but couldn't tell what it was, correct? Yes. And you indicated that you were thinking to yourself at the time in your statement, what does he have, a lead pipe, gun or something he's breaking car windows with, correct? Yes. Do you recall if Star described what was in the subject's hands at that time? At that time, um, while running and multitasking and looking around and trying to maintain officer safety, uh, I believe hearing he had some kind of bar something in his hand that he was actively using to break a window. So uh, I don't recall exactly what it was. It was an unknown weapon to the best of my knowledge. Did it appear that with this new information that in addition to the initial car burglaries you were investigating that an additional burglary of some kind was now in progress? Yes. Did these additional updates give you any extra considerations as to your mindset at all, what you were thinking about? Uh, yes, it was uh, the situation escalating. Uh, there was an, you know, active, ongoing uh, crime uh, being committed right now, and there are a lot of unknown elements happening in a short period of time. Okay. And I think you touched on it just a little bit earlier, but just to reiterate on it. You recall the information that Star was advising at all about the direction of travel and location of the suspect at this time when you were running? Yes, uh, that he was heading south down 29th Street towards Meadowview. Okay. Zero four twenty six twenty seven. Can you describe what happens here? Uh, at that moment, I am uh, checking the address, and this was an information that I had received from the sheriff's department helicopter uh, in my earpiece that he was describing the backyard that he currently saw the individual in. Uh, initially, he said that he saw the person running uh, towards the front yard. He gave a description of the vehicles there. Uh, at that time, I believed I had saw the subject, uh, and so I attempted to let Jared know that I had saw him at that location. So what is it you verbalized or voiced there? Uh, over here, over here, Jared. 
Okay. And that was directed towards Officer Robinette? Yes. Okay. And to clarify, too, it appeared, did you draw your firearm here at this point? Yes. Okay. On page 11 of your statement, you said, I did have my, my gun out just based on not knowing what's going on, information that I received from Starr that he didn't know what kind of weapon the person had in his hands. Is that correct? Yes. Did you ever consider drawing or arming yourself with any kind of less lethal weapon, such as your conducted energy device, or anything else as opposed to your firearm at this point? At that time, I did not. Why not? Uh, I was at a tactical disadvantage um, in the dark and uh, actually uh, illuminating my direction exactly where I was uh, based on officer safety dealing with unknown elements. It's always best to have your firearm ready to deal with any perceived threat. On page 9 of your statement, you said, and I saw a male black adult with a black hoodie sweatshirt pulled up over his head standing behind that vehicle. Is that correct? Yes. And then can you describe the route that you take here? Uh, yes, I um, began traveling up the driveway, which I I believe it was west, and I go in between the cars and the uh, side of the residence. Okay, is this going up along, uh, this is 29th Street, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, were you directed by the air unit over the radio as to the location of the suspect at this point? Yes. Okay. Were you under the impression that this subject you spotted was likely the same subject that air that the air unit was describing and directing you towards? Yes, based off the information I received. Hey! Show me your hands! Stop! Stop! 042635, what do you say here? Uh, I say, hey, show me your hands. Uh, stop. Stop. And are these commands that you're yelling? Yes, they are. And who are they directed towards? Uh, they're directed at the uh, individual who began running away from me. When you first yelled out these commands, how far would you estimate the suspect was from you? Approximately 20 feet. Do you recall if the suspect looked at you or was facing you or saw you at that time when you were giving these commands? Yes. Yes, the subject was facing me and appeared to be looking at me. On page 12 of your statement, when asked if you ever identified yourself as a police officer, you stated, I don't, I'm not quite sure if I did, if I did. Is that correct? Yes. And to this date, do you recall if you identified yourself as a police officer to the suspect? Uh, to this date, I, I did not. Can you give a reason as to why you did not verbally identify yourself as a police officer? No. Well, based on the fast evolving situation. I was in full police uniform. Uh, I was giving loud verbal commands to which is typically common of police officers such as stop and showing your hands. Uh, there was the sheriff's department helicopter that was overhead shining a light on uh, while making a circular kind of pattern or orbit and uh, Seeing that the subject had run away from me, it was uh, under my belief that he knew I was a police officer and began to flee from me. In your opinion, were you in foot pursuit at this time? Yes. Okay. Can you explain why you chased after this subject? Well, um, based on the facts and the information that I was receiving, uh, uh, like a fast evolving situation, uh, I was under the belief that, um, based on what the information the helicopter was giving me, that this individual had obviously already run over and jumped over a series of two fences and was again actively running. And there were a lot of unknown elements such as where was this person running to? Uh, what were, was going to be this person's reaction? Was this person going to possibly enter home? Uh, is there 
uh, another person uh, in the area that could potentially be harmed by this individual or a lot of unknowns. Would it have been practical or reasonable for you to just not chase after the subject at all? Uh, no, just based on the um, the likelihood and threat that this is a fast evolving situation, um, this person is proven to be uh, unpredictable. Uh, I was concerned that you know he may try to force his way into a residence, or um, if for some reason somebody was outside, he may try to harm that person. So uh, no, based off of what I believed and perceived is that I saw this individual and it was best to at least keep um, a good like visual of where he was and the direction he was going. Are foot pursuits inherently dangerous for police officers? Yes. Why? Well, you're dealing with unknown elements. You're dealing with um, a person who's actively trying to evade a police officer. And it's in my uh, training experience that often people who are evading police officers will uh, use whatever means or methods to either evade arrest or to um, possibly confront the officer or fight the officer. Did you ever lose sight of the subject? Yes. Do you recall where that was or when that was? At right about this period. At about this frame here? Yes. 042635? Yes. Okay. And about how long do you think, how long would you say that you had lost sight of this suspect until you saw him again? It was a, it was a matter of seconds. Uh, if I had to estimate less than five seconds or so. Zero four twenty six thirty seven. What is it you voice here? Uh, I voice uh, five seven south. So that was uh, an abbreviation of my identifier, which is Charles five seven, and uh, I was saying the direction south as to the direction the suspect was running. And were you attempting to? Were you verbalizing this in the attempt of uh, saying this over your radio, your portable radio? Yes. Um, did you know who the suspect was at this point? No, I did not. And I'll pause here at 042641. Can you describe the area where you appear to run to here? This this area here. Uh, it is a, a backyard um, with landscape and uh, various items in the in the landscape. Would this be the northwest corner of 29th Street? Yes. Was Officer Robinette behind you during this initial foot chase? Uh, I later found out that he was, yes. Okay. 042644, can you explain what happens to this point here? Um. To this point, I uh, give uh, the verbal commands of show me your hands gun, and the reasoning for that is because I saw the subject um, in the yard and he was uh, facing me. This location here, this northwest corner of the 29th Street, would this be uh, considered a position of cover, this corner area? Uh, can you just uh, can you specify? Are you talking about where I was or where so the northwest corner of the structure? Would that be a, a cover position? Yes. Okay. On page twelve of your statement, you said there was no lighting in the backyard, no rear porch, no back porch light, no lighting of any kind from the neighboring residences. All I recall is pitch black in the backyard there and the only light that I was able to use was my tack light on my firearm and then also in the background I could see star going around. It's his overhead light but his light was in a different area. It wasn't in the backyard where we were. Is that correct? Yes. So were you describing just the overall setting of the lighting here? Yes. On page 9 of your statement
you stated, I tried to pie around the corner or slowly tactically go around the corner. When I come around the corner, the corner of the house, I, I left cover and I look and I see the same subject with his hoodie and sweatshirt pulled up and his arms pointed out like this to where you demonstrate extending both of your arms out in front at chest level appear to take a shooting position. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you also stated that you thought the suspect had already shot at you because of a metallic reflection or muzzle flash. Is that correct? Yes. When you said the suspect was pointed out and extended like this, where was he pointing and in which direction was he pointing? At me. At you? Yes. On pages 10 and 13 in your statement, starting with 10. I see that the subject, you said, I see that the subject is advancing towards us, and I see that same bright metallic shining of the light in his hands, and I thought he had, was approaching and shooting at us. I believe we're being fired upon. As well as, and that's at the time, I thought I saw a muzzle flash, I was scared, I was like, oh my god, this is, he's shooting at me. The second time I come back around, he had advanced and moved up. He wasn't in that same position he was in. It looked like he was moving forward like this, and that the suspect had made a huge gap as possibly 10 feet or more towards you and was approaching. Is that correct? Yes. So to clarify, you're describing that the suspect is actually advancing on you. Is that correct? Yes. Referencing the terms that you were using to describe here, what did you believe the suspect was holding here? A firearm. Did you give any commands to the suspect to drop what he was holding? No. Can you uh, explain as to why not? Uh, everything was evolving very fast and very rapidly. Um, and the commands I do recall giving are showing your hands. Um, typically, from my experience, when a police officer says that, you would expect a subject to comply with showing their hands either forward or up. And as you indicated, you believe the suspect to be pointing and firing a gun at you both. Based on your training and experience, what reasons do you know of as why someone would advance closer to a target that they would be aiming or shooting at? Uh, with intent to um, harm that target. As far as uh, changing the distance, closing the distance, to does that do anything? Would that potentially, is there any reason why something, somebody would do something like that as far as uh, shooting at a target? Yes, uh, closing the distance typically increases your accuracy because you're closer to the target. Based on your recollection, can you estimate what these distances were that the suspect was in comparison to you and Robinette from his initial location where he advanced? He had advanced uh, approximately 10 feet and uh, from our position was between 10 and 12 feet from where we were. Pull your body cam video here again. <laughs> At 042648, uh, what did you say here? Uh, show me your hands, gun, gun, gun. Five, seven. you uh, made the decision to shoot at the suspect, correct? Yes. And can you, based on your recollection, can you estimate about how far away the suspect was from you and Officer Robinette when you fired? Uh, approximately 10 to 12 feet. I provided you with General Orders 580.02 Use of Force, Revision Date 516-2017, and 580.03 Discharge of Firearm, Revision Date 1-19-2018. Uh, if it's okay with you, would you like, I can, I can read a lot of the highlighted portions of those? Yes, please. Okay. So 5802, policy. It shall be the policy of the Sacramento Police Department that officers value and preserve the sanctity of human life at all times. 
Officers shall use only that amount of force necessary under the circumstances presented that the officer reasonably believes is required. Officers are expected to use de-escalation techniques when reasonably possible and without increasing the risk of harm to officers or others in an effort to reduce or eliminate the use of force. When using force, officers shall continuously reassess the perceived threat to select the reasonable use of force response. When making use of force decisions, officers should be mindful that subjects may be physically or mentally incapable of responding to police commands due to a variety of circumstances, including but not limited to alcohol or drugs, mental impairment, medical conditions, or language and cultural barriers. And under Procedure A Definitions, Section 9, De-escalation. Employing techniques to stabilize a situation to decrease the likelihood of the need to use force and to increase the likelihood of voluntary compliance. B. General. Force shall be used in compliance with Penal Code Section 835A, which states, Any peace officer who has reasonable cause to believe that the person to be arrested has committed a public offense may use reasonable force to effect the arrest, to prevent escape, or to overcome resistance. A peace officer who makes or attempts to make an arrest need not retreat nor desist from his efforts by reason of the resistance or threatened resistance of the person being arrested, nor shall such officer be deemed an aggressor or lose his right to self-defense by the use of reasonable force to effect the arrest or to prevent escape or to overcome resistance. Number two, officers may use deadly force if, under the circumstances, the officer reasonably believes that the suspect poses a threat of death or serious bodily injury either to the officer or to others. Section 5, when reasonable under the totality of circumstances where it may be accomplished without increasing the risk of harm to officers or others, officers should attempt to de-escalate situations. De-escalation techniques include but are not limited to gathering information about the incident, assessing risks, gathering resources, personnel and equipment, using time, distance, cover, using crisis intervention techniques, and community communicating and coordinating a response. Refer to GO 522.02 Emergency Care for Individuals Under Police Care and contr or Control when rendering emergency medical treatment or summoning medical assistance. Section C, subsection D. When the use of force has resulted in an injury, officers shall comply with the provisions of GO 522.02 Emergency Medical Care for the arrestees. If the individual is not arrested or will be released with the citation officers should offer to call for an ambulance or assist in arranging transportation to an authorized medical facility. Do you understand the general order that I read there aloud? Yes. Okay, and I'll read 58003. Discharge of firearm policy. It shall be the policy of the Sacramento Police Department that officers continually evaluate all reasonable and readily available force options to apprehend or subdue an individual before resorting to the use of greater physical and or deadly force. A thorough investigation will be conducted on all incidents result, resulting in firearm discharges by department employees. Procedure A General. Number one, officers may discharge a firearm in the performance of their official duty, A, in the necessary defense of themselves or in the defense of another person when the officer reasonably believes that an imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury exists. B, to effect an arrest prevent escape, prevent an escape, or recapture an escapee when the officer reasonably believes the suspect to be arrested poses an immediate threat to cause death or serious bodily injury if apprehension is delayed. Section 3, a verbal warning should perceive, precede the use of deadly force where feasible and when it will not increase the harm, the risk of harm to officers or others. 4, <coughs> justification for the use of deadly force shall be limited to what reasonably appears to be the facts known or perceived by the officer at the time. Facts unknown to an officer shall not be considered in later determining whether the shooting was justified. Number five, nothing in any firearms procedure shall preclude the, the drawing of the officer's firearm during the course of an arrest or investigation or when an officer reasonably believes it necessary for the safety of the officer or the safety of another. Seven, Refer to GO 522.02, Emergency Care for Individuals Under Police Care and Control, when rendering emergency medical treatment or summoning medical assistance. Do you understand the general order that I read? Yes. Okay. Now, as far as your justification for discharging your firearm and the use of force, would you like to stipulate that your voluntary statement provided to homicide investigators? <coughs> 
on March 19, 2018, articulates articulates your justification to discharging your firearm? Yes. Okay. Is there anything that you would like to add or clarify from that statement as to your justification for the use of force specifically discharging your firearm? No. In your opinion, do you feel you complied with or violated General Order 58002 use of force? Uh, in my opinion, I feel like I, cl I complied with. In your opinion, do you feel that you complied with or violated General Order 58003 discharge of firearms? In my opinion, I feel I complied with that general order. If you could, please articulate why, in your opinion, you feel that you complied with those general orders, and if possible, uh, citing any sections in those orders which you feel would apply. Is there a, a particular general order you would like me to begin with, or just up to me? Well, uh, yeah, up to you. I mean, after uh, everything I've read, there is. Are there anything, <coughs> any things in there that you would, any excerpts or anything in there that you think would apply as to why you felt that you complied with both those general orders? Yes, um, specifically uh, under the gen under Section B, General, uh, Section 2, um, where it says officers may use deadly force if under the circumstances the officer reasonably believes that the suspect poses a threat of death or serious bodily injury either to the officer or to others. Uh, I would feel that that applies in this situation. Well, we did reasonably believe, believe that. Um, also, specifically, when it refers to Section 5, and it discusses the uh, when reasonable under the totality of circumstances and where it may be accomplished without risking the, without increasing the risk of harm to officers or others, officers should attempt to de escalate situations. Unfortunately, we were not uh, afforded the time, uh, distance, or cover in order to. Um, de-escalate the situation. Um, as it pertains to <clears throat> 58003, discharge of firearm, um, under s section A, general, uh, one, subsection A, officers may discharge firearm in the performance of their official duty if A, in the necessary defense of themselves, or in the defense of another person when the officer reasonably believes that an imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury exists. Uh, in my opinion, I believe that applied to both Jared and I. We were both uh, in, felt we were in imminent danger. Um, also, uh, referring to the facts that were unknown to us. Uh, obviously, there are facts that we did not know uh, and we were going off of what we perceived at the time of the event. Okay. Anything else? No, that's it. Okay. Why don't we take a break? It is 15, 28, or 15 hours, 28 minutes. Okay, we're resuming at 15, 42 hours. Okay. Just prior to your firing, you appeared to come around the corner, then retreat back, and then peek back around the corner and engage the suspect. Is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> Was there a reason you decided to engage the suspect here as opposed to any other options, like fully retreating from your position? Um, in my opinion, retreating was not an option. Uh, from when I initially uh, peeked back around the corner, the subject had advanced towards us, and based on my training and experience, I know that subjects or um, potential threats that advance towards you are typically mean to do you harm. And um, retreating or turning my back and giving up that position would have put myself and Officer Robinette in um, imminent danger. Shots fired, subject, go! Shoot me out, good, good, good! So 042654, uh, gunfire by you and Officer Robinette appears to cease at this point, correct? Yes. On page 15 of your statement, <clears throat> you were asked,
asked as to whether the suspect exhibited any symptoms as to possibly suffering from mental health issues. You stated that you were unable to determine that, that it was dark, you gave commands for the suspect to show you his hands and he fled from you, and that you never heard him say a word nor get a good look at his face to see what his mental status was or if he was under the influence of anything. Is that correct? Yes. Referencing uh, from your crisis intervention training, do you think it would have been practical or safe for you to try and evaluate any of these symptoms or signs of the suspect potentially experiencing a mental health crisis or if he was under the influence of something given the timing of what you and Officer Robinette were faced with during your initial uh, pursuit and confrontation with the suspect? No, uh, I would not. Uh, we had a matter of seconds, so it was not a proper amount of time to perform an evaluation. Five seven shots fired. Some say down. Zero four twenty six fifty five. What do you say right here? Uh, I said five seven shots fired. Uh, suspect down. Zero four twenty seven zero zero. Um, at this point, what are you saying? Uh, show me your hands. And who is that directed towards? Uh, to the subject. And why are you saying that? Uh, based off of uh, what we perceived, uh, the subject was down. Um, we, for me, I could not see uh, one of his arms. I, it appeared one of his arms was underneath him. And so I wanted to um, see his hands to see that he didn't have uh, a weapon uh, still in his possession. Five seventies down. No movement. We're going to need additional units. Come in from the uh, west to east of the shard. Zero four twenty seven fifteen. What is it that you're saying here? Uh, I'm saying that the subject is down, there's no movement, and I'm directing additional resources uh, to where we are in the yard. And are you doing this over your radio? Yes. Let's see your hands! You alright? You hit? Yeah, I'm good. Zero four twenty seven twenty one. what is said here between you and Asher Robinette? Uh, I believe I asked him, uh, you already hit, and he says, yeah, I'm good. Um, what does that mean? Uh, what that means is that uh, I we were basically checking each other, checking your partner to see if uh, he was shot or injured or wounded uh, in, in any way. You're still pointing. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'm all right. I don't think I hit anything. Zero four twenty seven thirty one. What's being said here between uh, you and Officer Robinette? Um, Officer Robinette uh, made a statement that he was still pointing um, and he didn't finish his, his sentence. Then he asked uh, if I'm all right, uh, and then I said that uh, I was okay. I don't think I'm hit or anything, uh, meaning that I uh, didn't believe I, I was shot at the time or anything. Okay. On page fourteen of your statement. You said, the background was, was extremely dark, the grass was extremely tall, he was under a, an awning, like an overhang awning, which was directly protruded out from the house, probably seven, eight feet, or something like that. So he was at, at the awning, and I just remember seeing how tall the grass was. The grass, the backyard, was really unkempt, correct? Correct. So outside of the overgrown grass that you're describing here, can you describe the lighting at that time? Uh, other than the lighting from uh, my tack light and also Robinette's flashlight, there was no other lighting in that yard. Um, just looking at the video, I can see that there's a whole portion of the yard I can't even see. It's pitch black. Okay, and I may have, I don't know, I can't remember if I asked you this earlier or if I'm going to maybe ask it later, but I just want to make sure I touch on it. Can you give me the overall setting here of this? You obviously described how the grass was unkempt, mm -hmm. it was very dark. Mm -hmm. Can you describe anything else about this location here as far as your point of view, 
Are there any obstructions or anything like that that uh, you can recall at all from this? Yes, uh, there are several uh, obstructions. It looks like there's like a, a brick or a brick oven. Um, there's several other kind of various items uh, in the yard, uh, a couch, other furniture, a table. Um, and yes, really high overgrown grass and weeds uh, making it difficult to see. What about the suspect himself? Were you able to clearly see that he was no longer apparently armed or a threat to you and Officer Robinette at this time? No, I was not able to see that. And can you, I think you already kind of touched on it, but can you explain why you were not able to clearly see that? Uh, because of the condition of, of the yard and the lighting conditions. So uh, in particular, the grass was very high where uh, the subject went down. And uh, from my position, it appeared one of his arms was underneath him. And I believe that he was laying on a gun or was hiding a gun um, in an in attempt to um, hide or to um, ambush us, potentially. Zero four twenty seven forty six here. What is it that Officer Robinette is saying here? So what uh, Officer Robinette is saying is uh, he instructs me that he will take a cover position, which basically means he's going to um, uh, have his weapon and, and lighting position in a, uh, the direction of the suspect in case there is a further threat and that I should perform a tactical reload. Tactical reload essentially is a... Uh, your magazine from your firearm is not necessarily completely empty, but you should uh, reload it with a fresh magazine, a full magazine, in case uh, you need to continue delivering uh, additional rounds if the gunfight continues. And at this point, why didn't you and Officer Robinette make your approach of the suspect at this time? Uh, based on the, our training experience and then also the, the information we had at the time. The scene was not safe. Uh, we were waiting for additional resources to arrive. Uh, typically when you're approaching a down suspect or subject, you want to have additional resources available um, to make sure that you are uh, protecting the safety of the officers first and then um, dealing with any potential threats or problems that arise. on that. He's still down, he's not moving. We can't see the gun. At 042800, what is it that's being said here? Uh, so there's information coming in through uh, our radio earpiece, which is from um, one, the Sheriff's Department helicopter, and then also from the dispatcher. Um, at that time, I believe the dispatcher asked, um, do we want fire and uh, medical, uh, the fire department and medical resources uh, to come to that area and uh, we said stand by which means wait hold on uh, because we had determined it was not yet safe for them to enter. You good? Yeah, I'm good. Alright, All right, go. I got you. Go. You got him. Got him. 042811 here. What are you saying and doing here? Uh, Officer Robinette and I are communicating with one another. Um, he's asking if I have performed the reload that I was doing and if I was in a position to cover him. Um, and if he was ready to, uh, if it was safe for him to go ahead and perform his own tactical reload. Negative. Neither one of us are hit. We're okay. Suspect down. Zero four twenty eight fifteen. here. What are you saying here? Uh... Again, responding in my radio um, from my earpiece that, uh, you know, we don't need additional, um, well, I apologize, that fire and uh, medical resources, uh, it's not safe for them to enter yet. Um, and then also clarifying that 
neither I or Officer Robinette were shot, and that the suspect himself was down. Zero four twenty eight twenty three. What's being communicated here between you and Officer Robinette? Um, Officer Robinette says good, uh, basically indicating to me that he had performed the reload and he was prepared and just ready to go for whatever uh, may occur. Okay. And basically, both you and Officer Robinette conducted tactical reloads after firing at the suspect. You're correct. Yes, correct. And I think you already articulated why you did tactical reloads. Zero four twenty eight forty four. Here, what's being said here uh, by you? Um, so, while I was providing uh, cover, Officer Robinette was uh, attempting to provide radio updates uh, to our location, and he was describing the the house that we were at and the uh, direction so additional resources could get to us. I put in resources, I mean our backup uh, officers. Uh, but uh, while he's making that radio transmission in my earpiece. I hear the Sheriff's Department helicopter talking and communicating over the radio, which meant that Officer Robinette's transmissions were not getting out. So uh, when I say he's covered, 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 that means that what he was saying was not being heard. Only the Sheriff's Department uh, transmission was heard. Give the light. I got him. At 042848, what did you say here? What did that mean? Um... Basically, that means uh, I have uh, I'm I have a cover. Or I have uh, an eye, or I am prepared to deal with um, the subject if if there is an additional threat, and to use uh, telling Officer Robinette to use his flashlight to direct backup officers to where we are. Because once again, it's pitch black back back there. Uh, we were not anywhere near our police car, so I imagine other officers had a hard time finding us. We, we, we don't, we don't. 042909, um, SPD officers Taylor and Trujillo are the first responding backup officers to assist you and Officer Robinette, correct? Yes. I'm just going to back up just a bit here as to what was said. Uh, we, we, we don't, we don't, we don't have it. Do you see it, Jared? Zero four twenty nine twelve. Um, can you tell what's being talked about here or what's being said? Uh, yes. So Officer Taylor asked, "Do you have the gun?" Um, and Officer Robinette responded that we haven't secured it yet. So secured it means we haven't um, grabbed it or uh, taken it away from the subject or suspect to make sure that it was no longer a threat to us. And so um, the communication we're having back and forth is that. One, we don't have it in our possession, so it's not, the scene is not safe. And then two, uh, we're with the tall grass and the lighting conditions, we're trying to find and see exactly where the weapon or firearm is. Don't, I don't see it. Zero four twenty nine eighteen. Uh, can you s tell what Officer Robinette says there? Uh. Yeah, Officer Robert Burnett says, uh, I don't see it, and that he hasn't moved at all. And I believe he's talking with Officer uh, Trujillo back and forth. Zero four twenty nine twenty five. what does Officer Taylor ask or say here? Uh, Officer Taylor asks, uh, do we want to get him detained? And so that basically means, do we want to approach him uh, while he's down and... Um, detain him or place him in our custody and care uh, at that time. 
and I'm not sure if you can hear it there, but what, what's Officer Robinette's reply to what Officer Taylor asked there? Uh, Officer Robinette says not yet. Can you explain why uh, you did not make your approach of the down suspect at this point with officers Robinette, Taylor, and Trujillo on scene with you? Uh, yes, um, we began basically communicating and attempting to form a plan on how we will approach and uh, what will be the best method to approach. Um, at that time, we're you know aware that additional resources are coming in, um, and we're formulating a plan. In referring to the tactical lifesaver course that you took, can you articulate any lesson plans or materials from that course that you recall uh, which would apply in this scenario as to why no approach of the suspect had been made to this point? Uh, yes, I know specifically it was reiterated uh, often that um, not to approach uh, and render medical aid until the scene is safe and the scene is secure. Um, basically what that means is that it is, there is no longer a potential threat to the responding officers or emergency personnel who's there and at that time we still were unsure if the threat existed. I've earmarked page 29 of the Tactical Lifesaver Course Student Guide. Would you please read aloud the highlighted portions? Uh, beginning with assessment, treating, and guidelines. Tactical casualty care during law enforcement special operations is performed in three phases. The first is situational awareness and scene safety. Uh, and then in the first paragraph here it says, in the first phase you are about to enter a tactical environment and a possible crime scene. Your safety is paramount and the possibility still exists that you or other officers at some point may come under hostile fire. The tactical medic must be at all times be aware of the surroundings and any potential threats. The likelihood of having to draw your weapon and engage a suspect with deadly force is possible but extremely unlikely. And then moving down to section one, situational awareness and scene safety. First bullet point, determine if your surroundings are free of immediate life-threatening concerns. Second bullet point, do not attempt to provide first aid if your own life is in imminent danger. Does this material that you just read aloud, does it appear to be, to be consistent with your training regarding the tactical lifesaver course that you attended? Yes. In your opinion, would this information that you just read aloud apply in this incident on March 18, 2018? Yes, it would. And why? Um, as, I, as it states here, um, we need to determine if our surroundings are free from immediate life-threatening concerns and to not attempt to provide first aid if your own life is in imminent danger. Um, we were still under the belief that uh, this person was armed with a firearm and that they still possibly had the firearm in their, in their hands. And so it was not safe to approach at that time. And uh, we were trying to determine the best tactical way to um, approach and when it would be um, appropriate to do so. Have you been involved in or are you aware of any similar situations where law enforcement delayed their response for an immediate rescue of a suspect that law enforcement had shot or injured? Uh, yes, I am aware of that, yes. And any specific examples? Um, well, although I have not been a part of them uh, up until this particular event, um, throughout my law enforcement training, uh, I have received a lot of countless information regarding officer-involved shootings, uh, often active shooter situations in which um, officers will delay responding immediately up to a down subject or suspect until they determine that the scene is safe. And that is always for officer safety and, um, you know, making sure that you slow things down and you get the adequate resources you need to safely approach. Are you aware of any incidents where law enforcement officers have been shot by a suspect that they were trying to rescue? Yes, uh, I am aware of that. Uh, also, um, throughout my law enforcement career, uh, we've been told of uh, numerous situations 
in which officers were fatally shot by uh, rushing in to approach a down subject and that person was lying in wait is what they call it um, basically pretending to be hurt or injured uh, and then uh, once the police officer gets close enough they ambush that person by uh, ambush that officer by shooting them uh, at point blank range and so that definitely was a concern although it was not voiced that was a concern I believe was going on in all of our minds now it appears that you as well as other officers here are staying at the northwest corner of 29th Street as opposed to going out into the open area of the backyard. Can you explain why that is? Uh, yes, that northwest corner was providing us uh, cover um, with at least the side of the house provided uh, a layer of cover and protection from us uh, in case that very situation I just described as far as somebody laying in wait, lying in wait was uh, to unfold. Zero four twenty nine forty. Are you able to make out at all what Officer Robinette is saying here? Uh, yes, barely. Um, what Officer Robinette is saying is that uh, you know we can't see the subject's hands. Uh, he still hasn't moved. Uh, and then he asks three seven five, which is the uh, on duty sergeant or supervisor, if he can head over this way and he can use a body bunker before we detain him. Now what a body bunker is, is it's like, it's a shield. So it's a shield that provides uh, ballistic protection from bullets. Uh, and we were actually uh, considering getting that out so we could safely approach. Because like I said before, we were still under the belief that this person was armed with fire. So to clarify, you recall at that time um, that Officer Robinette was actually making that request for the body bunker? Yes. And you kind of indicated a little bit about a body bunker, but can you just elaborate on what a body bunker or ballistic shield <laughs> is, what it does? So the ballistic shields, um, like I said, they provide immediate protection for uh, police officers or specialty officers heading into um, a situation where they may encounter gunfire. So they can vary in size. Um, they can be uh, anywhere from, you know, two feet to four and a half, five feet in, in length. Um, and it's something that would help uh, protect against uh, gunfire. Zero four twenty nine fifty seven. What's all being said right here? Uh, we're making attempts to communicate uh, with the subject while he's down, um, trying to uh, determine if he can hear us, uh, if he's uh, under medical distress, and uh, we want, uh, as Officer Trujillo said, to um, know if he has his weapon or if he can discard his weapon if he can hear us. I'm good here. It's, I think Star put it out. He put it out. He put it out. He came up and then he he kind of approached us, hands out, and then fell down. 04329, what are you saying right here? Uh, talking with uh, officers Taylor Trujillo and Robinette, we're trying to describe to them the incident that unfolded and, you know, where he's at. Um, you know, we're telling him, telling them exactly uh, what we saw and, and the events that unfolded. Zero 
043046. Are you able to make out at all what Officer Trujillo is saying here? Do you recall what she says here? Uh, yes. Um, uh, I know she talks about uh, having the next unit when they come in to bring a non-lethal, and that's uh, a less than lethal option. Could be our less lethal shotgun. Um, could be uh, we have a 40 millimeter uh, uh, weapon. We have a uh, I'm sorry, a 40 milli 40 millimeter um, projectile uh, that is can be used for uh, less lethal contact. And she brings that up just in case that uh, the person is pretending or uh, lying in wait and uh, waiting for us to approach before uh, he moves. So to clarify, what exactly, is, what is a non-lethal? <clears throat> a non-lethal is, um, I guess the best way to describe it would be um, a tool which would could be a... Uh, such as a, like a drag stabilizing beam bag or some type of impact projectile that is used to for pain compliance to uh, not necessarily uh, be used for deadly force but more for um, uh, impacting force in order to gain compliance and to uh, get a person to um, comply. Okay. I, think, I think you kind of explain this, but I just want to make sure what's covered. Can you explain how a non-lethal or a less lethal shotgun would be applied in this setting? Uh, in this setting, it would be applied um, to use an impact weapon or a projectile to um, hit the subject uh, with that projectile to see if, if, if we get some kind of reaction or, or, or compliance from them um, to ensure that they are um, that they're not Faking it. I provided you with General Order 580.12, Less Lethal Weapon System, Revision Date 10 9 2012. Would you mind reading aloud the highlighted portions? Yes. Uh, policy. It shall be the policy of the Sacramento Police Department to deploy and use. Less lethal weapon systems as instructed in department training in order to maximize the safety of all individuals involved in an incident. Uh, a definitions one flexible baton round bean bag, a less lethal two and three fourth 12 gauge shotgun, shotgun round firing a Kevlar bag containing 40 grams of lead shot at a velocity of 280 feet per second. The drag stabilized projectile delivers uh, 112 feet pounds of, uh, foot of pound of energy on impact. Um, flexible baton rounds are discharged from a dedicated 12 gauge shotgun that is distinguishable by an orange buttstock and foregrip. This round provides accurate and effective performance when fired from the approved distance of not less than five feet, but not more than 50 feet from the target. Um, section C, deployment criteria. Less lethal weapon systems shall only be used in a manner that is consistent with department policy and training guidelines. Uh, number five, officers shall not deploy a less lethal weapon system unless specific information reasonably indicates the potential for the system's use. The circumstances for each incident shall dictate the reasonableness for the deployment. Uh, section E, use of less lethal weapons. Number one, Use of a less lethal weapon system shall be consistent with General Order 58002, use of force. Uh, number five, situations for use of the less lethal weapon systems may include, but are not limited to, A, self-destructive, dangerous, and or combative individuals, and C, circumstances where a tactical advantage can be obtained. Um, section F, tactical considerations. If possible, when a less lethal weapon system is to be utilized, a sufficient number of officers should be assembled to assist with the physical custody of the targeted subject. The number of additional officers and their responsibilities shall be dictated by the dynamics of the incident. And then uh, under that same section, number two, unless extraordinary circumstances exist, consideration should be given to the following responsibilities. A, deploying officers. At least one officer to, to discharge the less lethal weapon system. Multiple officers with less lethal weapon systems may be utilized in a single incident. 
the use of a canine and the conductive energy device may also be appropriate in concert with less lethal weapon systems. B. Protection officers a sufficient number of officers prepared to deliver appropriate force cover options given the immediate circumstances. C. Custody officers a sufficient number of officers who are responsible for handcuffing and restraining the subject. Uh, three, under exigent circumstances, nothing in this order shall prohibit an officer from deploying and discharging a less lethal weapon system without requesting authorization or having the presence of additional officers. Even though the less lethal shotgun was not actually deployed or used during this incident, it was considered. After reviewing that general order that you just read, do you feel this incident on March 18, 2018 would have been a practical use for it at any point? Uh, yes. Can you explain why? Uh, it would have. It would not have been practical uh, prior to uh, this incident because uh, at the time it was unknown that we would be dealing with a combative uh, or a threatening subject or individual. Um, uh, once we had adequate resources, uh, where it went from just two officers and it increased to four there were adequate resources to deploy it at that time because uh, you had a number of officers that would form as your arrest team or contact team, the person who would go put their hands on the person and physically detain them, a person who would uh, serve as a lethal cover, basically provide, uh, they would have their firearm ready in case they needed to um, protect uh, uh, from any lethal threat that presented itself, you'd have the person deploying the uh, less lethal option, and you could possibly have another less lethal option, whether it be your taser, uh, which is referred to as a conductive uh, energy device. The helicopter air unit star was on scene throughout the entirety of this incident, correct? Yes. Did you consider asking the air unit to visually verify if the suspect was still armed or a threat mm -hmm. while you were waiting? At the time, no, uh, we did not think of that. We did not consider it um, one of the factors. It's unclear uh, from the video or the body cam uh, footage, but uh, the Sheriff's Department helicopter that was orbiting uh, was giving a lot of uh, broadcast over the radio, and I could hear that in my earpiece. Uh, there was constant communication and transmission from him. Um, in addition to that, uh, I... You know, I, I'm not an expert um, on the technology used by the helicopter, but I, I don't believe that they can see um, objects such as that. So my follow-up question to you there was, do you feel that the air unit could have realistically verified that the suspect was still armed or a threat, where as a result you could make a safe approach at that point? Uh, no, I did not believe so. And, uh... Zero four thirty one sixteen here. Sergeant Morris three Sam five appears to arrive on scene. Do you recall what he says there when he first arrives? Um, initially, I, I uh, didn't realize it was him, but uh, I later realized he said that he didn't have a bunker and that we're just going to have to go in. Um, and, and as far as not having a bunker, meaning a body bunker? Yes, uh, he did not have a body bunker or ballistic shield. Zero four thirty one twenty three. Uh, can you tell or do you recall what Officer Robinette is saying here? Uh, yeah, Officer Robinette's uh, saying, let's get a non-lethal, uh, again referring to the less lethal, uh, options that are available and uh, actually hit him or deploy the uh, less lethal options uh, at him a couple of times before we approach. At the suspect? Yes, at the suspect. And can you explain why that would be considered? Um, kind of what I mentioned before, um, used as a pain compliance. Uh, it wouldn't be reasonable to 
use further deadly force um, unless uh, there was a potential, like an immediate threat that we, we could see. Um, so the idea behind that was to use uh, a less lethal option to gain compliance to get a reaction. Are you aware of other incidents in which a less lethal shotgun was utilized in the manner that's being referred to here? Yes, I am aware of other incidents. Any specifics that you're able to recall? Um, specifically, I, there have, has been um, other occasions and be situations similar to this in which a uh, uh, less lethal option is used and whether that be canine or a taser or bean bag uh, to try and gain compliance from the individual that's down and possibly still armed. We can't see his left hand. 043126 here. What did you say there? I was communicating that to Sergeant Morris that we can't see his left hand. Uh, basically letting him know that there was still a potential threat. Zero four thirty one thirty one. What did Sergeant Morris ask here? Uh, he asked, "What did he have on him?" Uh, I believe he was asking, like, what type of weapon did he have? The suspect. The suspect. Yes. Like this, something in his hands. It looked like a gun from our perspective. Zero four thirty one thirty seven. What did Officer Robinette say here? Uh, Officer Robinette said, like this, uh, something in his hands, looked like a gun from our perspective. Could you see what, if anything, Officer Robinette was demonstrating to Sergeant Morris there? Uh, um, <clears throat> out of the corner of my eye, Officer Robinette was demonstrating with his, uh, his hands, he was forming a gun shape uh, with his, both of his hands and his uh, index fingers and extending his arms outward. To this point, can you explain your reasons for not approaching the suspect now that Sergeant Morris is on scene? Um, we were basically doing a, a, a quick brief to Sergeant Morris about the circumstances, uh, what we perceived um, to currently be the situation, so giving him the information he needed to make a decision as the supervisor. At the time, did you have any concerns about, potential, about the potential of additional suspects? Uh, yes, that was always a consideration. There are a lot of unknowns, and uh, we didn't know where we were and um, if the scene was safe for us to approach. You guys ready? Zero four thirty one forty five. What did you say here? Uh, I said, "You guys ready? Um, basically, are we ready to approach?" Because I seen uh, the officers moving uh, to get into position, they began moving forward. Yeah. Let's go. Zero four thirty one fifty. what did you say there? Uh, let's go, let's, let's approach. Let's approach, or let's approach. meaning let's approach. Let's approach um, the subject. So at this point, what are you doing here at this point then in the video? Uh, in the video, we are uh, making a, a tactical approach. Basically, it's just a slow approach. Um, we have our, or at least I have my firearm out and drawn, uh, I believe. Uh, well, I, I don't know what everyone was doing behind me. I was focusing down on uh, the down subject, and so we were just making a slow, uh, progressive approach towards him. To your knowledge during this approach, um, do you know on whether or not a body bunker or any kind of less lethal weapon was being deployed and used for this approach? Uh, I don't know. I, I kept my attention focused towards uh, the suspect. But we did not have a body bunker. Do you recall if a decision was made by anyone as to why the approach of the suspect was being made at this time? Uh, no, I just recall that Sergeant Morris was the supervisor and being the ranking officer, he told us let's go and began uh, a movement and approach and I followed his instruction. 
do you recall if any kind of plan as to who would be designated as cover officers, hands, officers, less lethal options, or anything like that prior to your approach? Uh, as we're making our approach, um, uh, Officer Robinette mentions one of you guys needs to go hands, and basically that means um, needs to be the person to put your hands on the suspect and detain him. And I had said that I will uh, be that person by saying I'll cuff. But as far as just prior to your approach, was any kind of plan made as far as who was designated for which duties at all for this approach, do you recall? Uh, I do not recall that. Zero four thirty one fifty eight. It's kind of hard to see here, but it looks like Sergeant Morris appears to make physical contact with the suspect here. Is that correct? Yes. Zero four thirty two zero seven. Uh, Sergeant Morris, Officer Taylor, uh, and you appear to physically contact and uh, search the suspect. Is that correct? Yes. And what did you say there? Uh, I'll cuff, I believe is what I said. Okay. And what does that mean? I will put my handcuffs on uh, the person to fully detain him. Okay. And did you handcuff the suspect? Yes. And what was the reason you said to detain him? Was there a reason why uh, he was being handcuffed? Um, still dealing with the unknown, uh, if there was a, a firearm on his person or underneath him or in the, the immediate, immediate vicinity. So placing the handcuffs is basically putting this person into custody so that he's no longer a uh, immediate threat. Officer Taylor asked you to do here? Uh, to give me his light. Uh, so basically, Officer uh, Taylor was putting on his um, uh, latex gloves for um, protection, and uh, he wanted light so he can help uh, see what he was doing. So what were you doing then when, when he asked that? Uh, I was giving him the light that he asked for. How were you doing that? Uh, I was uh, using my flashlight uh, and just... Um, Illuminating, uh, first of all, if we're going to be performing CPR, it's just my light to illuminate uh, the suspect that was down and then also illuminate the area so Officer Taylor could uh, apply his latex gloves. Amen. Look at my gloves on. Just show me the light. Zero four thirty two forty two. Um, so on page five of your statement, you indicated you had a tourniquet on your person as part of your equipment, correct? Yes. Was there a reason at this point that you did not assist in performing CPR with either rescue breathing, chest compressions, checking vitals, or applying a tourniquet to the suspect at this time? Um, yes, I applied my, actually applied my, uh, was in the process of applying my latex gloves and then I was directed, um, I later found out, I believe it was uh, Sergeant Morris to, hey, go get your rescue mask or I was directed by someone to go get my rescue mask and so, uh, which is typically required to uh, administer CPR. So I was in the process of going to get that. Um, at some point I heard somebody else saying, I have my CPR or rescue mask, and they were proceeding towards the backyard to basically take the position I was going to have. Now at this point here on the video, you had verbalized that let me get my gloves on, is that correct? Yes. Now what's the purpose of getting your gloves on? Uh, putting my gloves on, um, obviously once we made a, an approach, we saw that the individual was actively bleeding um, for you know protection from uh, blood and the 
uh, risk of um, disease that sometimes comes from it. You apply your uh, latex gloves for personal safety. It's part of your personal protective equipment. Based on your training experience, do emergency first responders such as fire or medics or hospital staff typically treat any kind of patient without first putting on latex or rubber gloves? No. We're gonna need at zero four thirty two uh we'll call it forty seven here. Do you recall Sergeant Morris calling out to you? Um I don't recall if it was Sergeant Morris. I just remember somebody calling out to me and saying, hey, come over here, um, along with, you know, go get your rescue mask. We'll play it again. Here. Okay. We're going to need uh, CPR stuff. Look at my gloves on. Just show me light. All right. So right there, uh, 043244, do you hear any anything about anybody calling out to you at all? From the body worn camera, I do hear it uh, at the time. I didn't hear my name called uh, at that time of the incident. I'm focused on Taylor, putting my gloves on and uh, getting ready to begin CPR. So you, you didn't recall your name being called right. at that time, at but that when time. watching it now, yes, I hear it's it now. apparent that your name is getting called. Yes. I know. We're gonna need uh, CPR stuff. Zero four thirty two forty eight. What is it that you said there? Uh, we're gonna need CPR stuff so we can begin uh, performing CPR. Zero four thirty two fifty six. What was being said here uh, between you and Sergeant Morris? Uh, you you want to go get your mask for us, uh, which. I knew that my rescue mask was in my patrol car, which was uh, down the street on 29th Street. Um, yes. Rescue mask? Rescue mask to CPR? 043306, uh, what's happening here? Um, there's multiple officers responding uh, to the scene. I'm advising them that we need a rescue mask and saying, hey, you know, get your rescue mask for CPR. Okay. And what <clears throat> what is a rescue mask? Um, a rescue mask is basically a, uh, a plastic seal, which is commonly used in CPR, that uh, goes over the nose and mouth of a uh, injured party, injured individual, and it's used to give uh, what they call rescue life breaths into their um, lungs so that you can help uh, get them going, but also it helps prevent cross-contamination uh, from the rescuer and the down person. And you had indicated <clears throat> earlier you believe that your rescue mask was in your vehicle at the time? Yes. Okay. And is that typically where you would keep your rescue mask at the time? <clears throat> yes. Five seven. Why don't you go ahead and code for the beeper, please? Zero four three three ten. What is it that you voiced right here, or verbalized here? Um, so, <clears throat> whenever uh, any critical incident is ongoing, the dis the radio or the dispatcher will initiate a beeper. It's basically a, a high pitched tone that intermittently goes off on the radio, and that's indicated that. Um, officers are in a priority situation and that they have unless you're directly involved in it you uh, don't have a priority to talk on the radio and so that beeper is as it's commonly referred to was constantly going off and uh, seeing how the situation was no longer active and, and fluid I told them to go ahead and turn that beeper off that's something we commonly do did you end up retrieving your rescue mask I did not do you recall the reason why? Um, <clears throat> as I was walking out of the yard, I recall somebody else saying, I got it, and somebody heading back to uh, uh, assist with CPR. Um, and then also I uh, 
kind of recall it being everything kind of gathering and, and being instructed to kind of stay there in the front of the house. We need a rescue mask. Are you back there? Uh, no, we need a... Zero four thirty three thirty six. Here, what is happening here at this point? Um, Officer Robinette and I are approached by. Uh, it appears to be Officer uh, Lundgren there, um, in which he's asking, "Hey, are you guys all right?" Um, we, uh, I believe, somebody says, "Hey, mute." Uh, in which we were instructed to uh, mute our body worn cameras. <clears throat> you recall which officer said mute? Uh, possibly Officer Longer, I, I don't recall. Okay. You want to take a break? Sure. Okay. Take a break at 1634. Okay, it's 1639 hours. And so just to get this on the record, um, referring earlier as I indicated the materials provided to you, um, during our first break, I provided you a 19 second video clip of Sergeant Morris's body worn camera video from this incident. Uh, is that correct? Yes. And did you have uh, time, you and your representative, time to review that video? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> At 043338 on your body worn camera, it mutes here. Is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> and can you recall the reason for muting your body camera at this time? Um, yes, uh, the officers that were there, Officer Lundgren, I, I believe, being one of them, uh, wanted to just check on our welfare. And uh, our prior training that we were provided uh, on the body worn camera was uh, anything that is not per directly pertaining to investigation. So, for instance, private co personal conversations, uh, you were to mute your body camera. And that's all we did there was uh, those officers asked if we're okay and how we're doing. Pausing at 043353, it appears as though Officer Robinette is pointing towards the backyard of 29th Street with Officer Lundgren going in that direction. Can you describe or do you recall what was said there? Um, I think he basically asked where was everything and we just pointed, uh, uh, Officer Robinette, I'm sorry, pointed to that direction. Uh, he was just checking to see if we were okay. That was it. Just. Personally, am I doing all right? Is Officer Robinette doing all right? Play. Keep playing here. So pausing at 043410, <clears throat> it appears that um, from this point forward that you Officer Robinette and Sergeant Morris are out in front of 29th Street, correct? Yes. And do you recall what kind of conversation, if any, was had between all of you? Um, I believe we had what's what's called a, a public safety statement where he's just asking first if we're okay and then uh, he asked pertinent information like, uh, you know, did you shoot, how many times did you shoot and what direction uh, did you shoot at? And I'll fast forward a bit here. It, your video stays muted throughout the duration until it turns off here, correct? Yes. Okay. Zero four thirty five forty seven. Your body worn camera video stops, correct? Yes. And do you recall the reason at that time why uh, you had turned off your body worn camera? 
Sergeant Morris had directed us to um, verbally and then also uh, motioned to turn it off, okay. deactivate. Now I'm going to refer to the video, the 19 second clip uh, from Sergeant Morris's body worn camera video that will start up here. And it appears to start at uh, timestamp 04 34 22. So referring to this video clip here, um, what is being said here between you and Sergeant Morris? He's asking, uh, like I said before, the public safety statement, how many rounds did I shoot um, and what direction uh, did I shoot them at? And what did you tell Sergeant Morris in relation to that? Uh, I just said five, uh, five or six is what I had believed at the time. As to how many rounds you believed that you fired? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Referring to page 10 of your statement to homicide detectives. Okay. You stated, I believe we're being fired upon, and I believe I fired, what, 10 times. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Referring to the round count form that I provided you with, mm -hmm. um, a round count was conducted by homicide investigators with you, correct? Yes. And this round count was done prior to your actual interview with homicide detectives? Yes. And it was determined in that round count that your firearm was missing 10 live rounds of ammunition, which would indicate you fired 10 rounds, correct? Correct. Okay. Based on your statement <clears throat> to homicide where you said you believed you fired 10 times, were you indicating how many rounds you became aware of that you fired at the time of the interview, or were you referencing your memory at the time of the shooting, which would have been different as to what you told Sergeant Morris at the time? Um, uh, to answer your question, it was uh, with regards to <clears throat> the amount of rounds that I became aware of that I fired, and that was after the round count. Um, obviously, at the time I, I made this statement to Sergeant Morris, I was... Uh, uh, stressed, and uh, I had perceived that I had only fired five or six shots. Based on your training and experience, can you explain why that discrepancy <coughs> might be where you initially thought or you believed that you fired five to six times, but you had actually fired more than that? Uh, yes, so based on my training and experience, often uh, there are physical and physiological changes that uh, occur during a critical incident, uh, basically stress. Um, and that stress can have a lot of effects and some of those effects are uh, misperception of time and um, uh, short-term memory losses in terms of uh, the actual events as they unfolded. Okay. Would you consider this incident a very stressful situation? Yes. I provided you with General Order 525.07 Body Worn Camera, Revision Date 4-26-2017. Would you mind reading aloud the highlighted portions? Yes. Um, <clears throat> policy. Show me the policy of the Sacramento Police Department to utilize the Body Worn Camera in a manner that will assist in criminal prosecutions or civil litigation by providing a recording of the incident that may supplement an employee's report and help document professional police conduct. Uh, under Procedure A, General, one, officers issued a body-worn camera required to wear and use their body-worn cameras while working in uniform. Uh, uniform is to be considered the standard uniform as well as any apparel, for example, tactical or raid vests, that identifies the wearer as a police officer. Body-worn camera video provides additional information regarding an investigative or enforcement contact, with a member of the public, as body-worn camera recordings provide only a limited perspective of the encounter, all other available evidence such as witness statements, officer interviews, forensic analysis, and, document and documentary evidence should be considered before any conclusions are reached. Uh, body-worn cameras should assist in the following A, documenting an initial police response. Under Section B, uh, employee responsibility. Number two, Employees assigned a body-worn camera shall 
affix their body worn cameras to the uniforms at the beginning of their shift in accordance with training and the manufacturer's guidelines. The body worn camera shall be worn for the entire shift. Under section C, required activation of the body worn camera. Number one, this policy is not intended to describe every possible situation in which the body worn camera should be utilized. Not all situations will clearly start out as necessitating the activation of the body worn camera, nor will all events have a clear ending when the body worn camera is no longer necessary. Number three, employees shall activate their body worn cameras during any enforcement or investigative activity, whether self initiated or in response to a dispatch call. Examples include but are not limited to the following uh, Section C, when conducting pedestrian and vehicle contacts. D, while responding to any in progress or uh, just, a car, just occurred uh, or any other call for service in which the fleeing suspect and or vehicles may be captured leaving the crime scene. E, when responding to calls reportedly involving weapons or violence. G, when pursuing a suspect on foot. H, during code 3 responses including vehicle pursuits regardless of whether the vehicle is equipped with an end car camera system. I while executing searches of individuals, vehicles, buildings, and other places, and then K, when conducting arrests, detention, and expectations. And then Section D, uh, deactivation of the body worn camera, one, except as listed below, once activated, officers shall not deactivate their body worn cameras until the investigative or enforcement activity involving a member of the public has reasonably concluded. If enforcement or investigative activity with a member of the public resumes, Officer shall reactivate the body worn camera and continue recording. Uh, employees may deactivate the body worn camera at any time based on their discretion in the following circumstances. A. When the employee is discussing tactical or confidential information with other law enforcement personnel during briefings or other conversations with confidential informants. C. When it is necessary to discuss issues or concerns with an employee, supervisor, doctor, nurse, or paramedic in private. Uh, number three, details regarding the reason for deactivation should be recorded and documented when appropriate. In reviewing this incident regarding your body-worn camera and its use on March 18, 2018, do you feel you complied with or violated this general order? Complied with. Can you explain why? Uh, yes, um, and then specifically uh, as it talks to... Um, the activation of the body worn camera was activated at the beginning of uh, basically the start of the call for service for uh, Officer Robinette and myself, uh, which is when we first got out of our patrol vehicles and contacted the complainant um, all the way up until the end of uh, the conclusion of uh, my involvement in the investigation. Um, the body worn camera was uh, muted. Uh, and it falls under Section D, deactivation of the body worn camera. Um, employees may deactivate the body worn camera at any time based on their discretion in the following circumstances. When the employee is discussing tactical or confidential information with other law enforcement personnel. Um, and so at that time, he's muted because um, Officer uh, Lundgren was asking our well being, and that was confidential information, just asking what we were doing, uh, how we were doing, um, in regards to our, our well-being. You, you had mentioned that muting would be under the deactivation portion of body-worn camera, or that, that was addressed there, is that correct? Uh, that's correct, although it does not say uh, muting at the time of this general order, uh, and, I, and I apologize because muting is not listed under here, but at the time muting was not deemed deactivating. Um, so the follow-up question, are you aware of anything in that policy that you read from that time that addressed muting? No. And for the record, in reviewing body-worn camera footage from this incident, approximately four minutes and 57 seconds elapsed between your, when yours and Officer Robinette's gunfire ceased to the point officers first made physical contact with the suspect, Stephon Clark. <clears throat> Approximately 59 seconds after that, officers begin CPR on Clark. Does that sound accurate? Yes. In your opinion, do you feel it was reasonable to wait that amount of time up to when officers made contact with Clark 
to render first aid. Yes. Why? Uh, as I've stated before, we were um, formulating a plan, trying to determine if the scene was safe, and from our the information, the limited information we had, the scene was not safe to approach. I provided General Order 522.02, .02, Emergency Care for Individuals Under Police Care or Control, Revision Date 5-16-2017. Would you please read aloud the highlighted portions of Policy and Section A-1 and 2. It shall be the policy of the Sacramento Police Department to provide emergency and medical treatment to individuals under police care and control while ensuring their safety and that of others during treatment. Um, number one, officers having any doubt concerning a person's condition shall request emergency medical assistance. Two, officers shall provide first aid to injured parties if it can be done safely. In your opinion, when was the suspect under police care or control as stated in General Order 522.02? Uh, as soon as they became under our control when we physically touched him. And so when the, when the suspect was first physically con uh, control or contacted controlled, by yes. our officers? Yes. Okay. In your opinion, do you feel you were able to provide <coughs> first aid to the suspect safely as stated in Section A, Subsection 2, any sooner than when you made your eventual approach of the down suspect? No. Okay, and again, your reasoning as to why? Uh, Based off of the information that we had and the, the circumstances of the event, we uh, determined the scene was not safe to approach. In your opinion, do you feel you complied with or violated General Order 522.02 and why? Uh, complied with um, because, uh, as it states here, officers shall provide first aid to injured parties if it could be done safely. Uh, the issue that uh, for us was that uh, ensuring that we could provide medical aid safely and uh, that was something we were trying to um, establish so we can go apply that medical aid. Would it have been reasonable to direct fire medics to enter the scene and medically treat the suspect prior to officers safely securing the scene and arresting or detaining mm -hmm. the suspect? No. Um, Emergency personnel, uh, emergency medical personnel will not approach a situation if the scene is not safe or secure for them to enter and do their work. In your opinion, do you feel your actions regarding this officer involved shooting on March 18th, 2018 would be considered a neglect of duty? No. And why not? Uh, I was using the um, training uh, that I was provided uh, throughout my law enforcement career to uh, develop the best plan in, in which to um, deliver medical aid, medical assistance, and um, a resounding theme with all that training is to make sure that it can be done safely and securely. Regarding the decision your decision to delay in the amount of time you did in approaching and treating the suspect, in your opinion, do you feel your actions pertaining to that would be considered a neglect of duty? No. And again, why not? Uh, again, um, following the training and the set of facts and circumstances that we had at the time of that incident, um, we were doing the best we could to make sure that we were um, putting our safety and the safety of the other officers um, first before we went and applied medical care. Did you know Stefan Clark prior to this incident? No. To your knowledge, had you ever had any interactions or dealings with Stefan Clark prior to this incident? No. Did you have any reason to know that the fleeing suspect, who eventually was Mr. Clark, was running into a family member's backyard at 29th Street just prior to the shooting? No, we had no information about that. Looking back at the incident, did you ever think that the suspect wanted the police to shoot him? Initially, um, that is not uh, something that I perceived, but given the amount of uh, information that has come out um, throughout the last year, um, yes, I believe that that was something that was uh, planned and intended. That is my personal opinion, uh, yes. I'm going to refer to the dispatch audio here. Sunday. We'll go to Sunday. 
0801 on the audio here, you're indicating that the suspect is down, no movement, uh, which we already kind of covered that on your body camera, correct? Yes. Okay. And then fast forwarding here. Eight minutes, 44 seconds here. Dispatch asks, is fire clear to enter? Is that correct? Yes. Do you recall if you copied that question on the radio at that time? Uh, I believe I did copy it, and uh, yes, I believe I did. Nine minutes, 13 seconds, your dispatch asks, 5-4, is fire clear to enter, is that correct? Yes. Nine minutes, 22 seconds here. Uh, you reply negative, neither one of us are hit, we're okay, suspect down, is that correct? Yes. Now, was your response as negative indicating that it was not clear for fire to enter, or did you understand the question differently where you thought dispatching was asking if you yourself were injured and needed fire? Uh, could you repeat that, please? Yeah. Sorry. Was your response as negative indicating that it was not clear for fire to enter, or did you understand the question differently where you thought dispatch was asking if you yourself were injured and needed fire? Uh, the, I perceived it, uh, they were, I perceived actually as both that they're asking is fire clear to enter um, under the belief that, you know, that they needed to get in immediately. And my answer to that was no. Um, it was not safe to do so, and that's when I clarified that Officer Robinette and I were okay. okay. So to follow up, in your opinion, was it clear or safe for fire to have entered the scene and medically treated the suspect at that time anyway? No. So on March 19, 2018, you provided a voluntary statement to SPD Homicide Detective Cruz regarding your involvement in SPD case 18-82449, correct? Yes. I'd like you to refer to page 6 of your statement in that report. Yes. yes. You stated that when you responded to this call, CAD call 18-82449, the suspect description indicated on the call that the suspect was a male black as to his ethnicity. Now I've reviewed the CAD call printout for this call 18-82449, the audio recording for SPD radio traffic, and as well as um, having listened to the audio recording from the caller complainant to SPD dispatch and I could not locate any documentation or information where it indicated the suspect was a male black as to his ethnicity. Can you explain where that information came from regarding the suspect's ethnicity in your statement? Uh, yes, uh, the description comes from... Um, I did not know the suspect's uh, ethnicity prior to contacting him. Now, obviously, uh, we had uh, went and contacted him and began medical care uh, at which was the first time that I saw his ethnicity. Uh, prior to providing this voluntary statement, I had uh, obviously just encountered that hours before, and then I reviewed the body more camera footage to help uh, refresh my memory, and uh, that's when I uh, identified the subject as African American, and then I, during my statement, uh, provided that information. And do you recall if uh, the, the complaint on this that was first contact on this, do you recall if he had described the suspect's ethnicity at all to you or Officer Robnett when you first contacted him when your body-worn camera initially had no audio? I believe when we first contacted him, he did not provide a race. He said he didn't know and it was too dark to see. On page 10 of your statement, 
you indicated that Officer Taylor began performing CPR on Clark, correct? Correct. And on that same page of your statement, uh, you had said, I recall somebody else saying that they were going back there to take care of it, to get a rescue mask. I began to assist on CPR. Is that what it says there? That is what it says there. Okay, I'd like to refer to your homicide interview video here starting at 23 minutes, 5 seconds. Start doing CPR, life saving measures. Okay. And do you recall who performed CPR? I believe Officer Taylor uh, began performing CPR. I went to put my gloves on, I went to go get the rescue mask. Um, and then I remember that I was, I recall somebody else saying that they were going back there to take care of it, to get a rescue mask, uh, to begin to assist with CPR. Can you tell at that last line there what it is that you say? Uh, it appears that there's a um, typo here, but based off of the homicide video, it sounds like opposed to I began to assist with CPR, it says that's a continuation of the sentence to get a rescue mask to begin to assist with CPR. So are you referring, basically I'm trying to just clarify, you're not actually saying here that you began to assist with CPR, but that someone else was going to, is that correct? That is correct. So what's written in the statement there in where it indicates that you're saying that you assisted with CPR, that's not accurate. No, is that not. correct? That's correct. And let's play it one more time just to make sure that we're, we're clear on that there. I went to put my gloves on, I went to go get the rescue mask, um, and then I remember that I was, I recall somebody else saying that they were going back there to take care of it, to get a rescue mask, uh, to begin to assist with CPR. To get a rescue mask to begin to assist with CPR? Yes. And relating to somebody else, not you? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Detective Brown, is there anything else? What? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was gonna. Sorry. Ask you. I was gonna. Counselor, you have anything? Or? Oh, um, just one quick question, uh, Terrence. Referring back to uh, you, you recall when you were asked about why you did not uh, identify yourself as a police officer? Uh, yes, I recall. Okay, and. <clears throat> Do you, do you believe he ran away because he was aware that you were a police officer? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and again, you, you've spoken at length um, about officer safety. Is that correct? Yes. And was that a, a chief concern for you when choosing not to approach the subject? Yes. Uh, to provide medical aid? Yes, it was. Okay. That's all I had. Just real quick, why, why do you believe he uh, knew you guys were officers when he fled? Um, honestly, based off of the circumstances, uh, when I first encountered uh, the suspect in the driveway, uh, I could see that he was appeared to be facing me and looking at me. And uh, given that I was in full police uniform, uh, I was giving loud verbal commands that were uh, common, commonly used by uh, police officers and the presence of the um, Sheriff's Department helicopter overhead and that this individual had been running, f appeared to be running from that Sheriff's Department helicopter and appeared to be aware that the helicopter was there and, uh, and uh, following him, that I believe that he observed me and that I believe that he observed that I was a police officer. Counselor, anything additional? No, thank you. <coughs> Is there anything else relating to this matter which we have not covered that needs to be added, clarified, or changed? If so, I am ordering you to provide that information now. No. After you leave this interview, should you remember anything that is different from or in addition to the information that you've been given today, I am ordering you to contact me immediately, or Sergeant Bullard immediately. I am also ordering you not to discuss this matter with any other department employee. Do you understand these orders? Yes. We will conclude the interview at 5.08 p.m.